Hey, folks, welcome to Draft Talk. I'm Alan Saunders, joined as always by Nick Farabaugh on Pittsburgh Sports Live. It's Tuesday, March 29th. We are talking a quarterback. You know, it's, it's kind of been the thing so far for the Steelers offseason as they prepare for the 2022 NFL Draft this April. We've gone over most of the top candidates vaguely in the order of their pro days as the Steelers have gotten to them. We talked about Kenny Pickett. We talked about Malik Willis from Liberty. We talked about Matt Corral from Ole Miss and Desmond Ritter from Cincinnati. The one that's left was where Kevin Colbert was on Monday, and that was at the pro day of North Carolina quarterback Sam Howell. Um, Howell is a player that Colbert is very familiar with. He went down to Carolina to cover him at a practice this season. He also covered, uh, he, he was live at uh, Heinz Field for Carolina's game against Pitt, uh, which Kenny Pickett won in a rainstorm. And so they saw him at the Senior Bowl. They saw him at the Combine. They know a lot about Sam Howell. Mike Tomlin not able to be there because of his commitments to being on the league competition committee. But Colbert was there. Matt Canada was there. Obviously, the Steelers are still interested in getting to know more about Sam Howell at this point. And I think to me, uh, th this quarterback class feels pretty well shaken out to me. Like, I think Malik Willis is very high upside, maybe, you know, high beta, right? May not reach it, but very high upside. Kenny Pickett, extremely high floor, looks like it looks like an NFL starter. Ritter, maybe slightly, le slightly less of a high floor, but still looks like a promising, you know, prospect. Corral, again kind of high upside but but very low floor and could be anywhere i really struggle with where to put sam howell in that paradigm is he quarterback three is he quarterback five does he have upside does he have does he have floor uh and and i think it all depends on how much you looked at his two seasons at carolina right the 2020 sam howell is an incredible nfl prospect the 2021 sam howell I don't know. Nick, uh, what, what do you make of Hal and, and where do you put him in the hierarchy of these five guys we're talking about near the top of the draft? He's kind of an intriguing prospect because he does have pretty good tools. I think he's a tough runner. I think he's got relatively good athleticism. I think his arm is very good. I really like his arm, actually. So he's kind of a, you know, him, him and Matt Corral are very similarly built players. Um, and I think the thing about Hal is, He's that willing, tough runner you have, too, that you get in corral, right? Like, those two are really willing to put their bodies on the line and just run. And we saw that a lot this year. I mean, there was a surprising amount of broken tackles Sam Howell broke this year. I think he actually led the ACC in broken tackles per touch. Um, so it, that's efficient, too. And so that was interesting. But I don't know where you put him in the, in the hierarchy. I like him better than corral, I think. I think he's a better arm. I also think he has a similar transition, though, to Corral, right? RPO heavy scheme and Phil Longo's scheme um, doesn't necessarily – I think he has better processing than giving credit for. Like, I think his eyes get to where they need to be a lot more than people say. Yeah, he'll misread sometimes. I don't think he's perfect going through his progressions. But I actually don't think he's that bad in that area. I think that's one of his relative – okay parts i think when you look at what his issue is it's always going to be his pocket presence and poise under pressure whenever pressure got in on him watch that virginia tech game that's all you need to learn about that whenever you watch the pressure that gets in on him he really collapses as a player uh, completely the processes go away um, his mechanics go away everything just kind of falls apart because he gets doe-eyed in front of those defenses so that's going to be the biggest one so me qb4 maybe um, I think that sounds about right. I don't think I'd put him above Ritter because Ritter's so advanced uh, men mentally. And yes, Ritter's mechanics are terrible, and we talked about that. But I think Howell has issues against pressure and with pocket management, but I also think he has footwork issues. So I think QE4 sounds about right for me to Sam Howell. I think that's fair. I think the big thing when you're looking at a quarterback, you know, if you're talking about a guy that's a franchise-type quarterback, I think one of the important things is – he needs to be able to elevate the talent around him, right? I think that's like a defining characteristic of what makes someone a franchise quarterback. You know, the Steelers 
have you know for the last 15 years not really spent a lot of money on wide receivers because they just kept recycling through the draft and and they'd, they'd feel confident that they could find new ones and they like their scouting process but also that they had ben roethlisberger so they didn't need to spend big money on wide receivers because they had a really good quarterback who could elevate talent you look at the last two years with sam howe 2020 Deami Brown, Javante Williams, Michael Carter. He's in this dynamic, uh, Daz Newsom. He's in this dynamic offense with all these playmakers, and it looks awesome on tape, and it works. And then the other, you know, the rest of those guys leave for 2021. And I mean, I think Ty Chandler's a okay running back, and and but he really lost the talent around him, and everything started to fall apart. Now you can't. You can't work with nothing as a quarterback. You need to have some level of talent. But, I mean, I look at what Malik Willis did at Liberty with just no one, and I think that was more impressive than what Hal did with, okay, less help than he had in 2020. But certainly uh, I felt like underperformed my expectations this season. Well, here's the – Ty Chandler's better than anyone that Malik Willis Mm -hmm. ever had, and so is Josh Downs. Josh Downs is, a, is a, going to be a junior this year, but he was good last year. Yeah, he might have been their only receiver, but he was at least good. So when you looked at what he had, he didn't have that much for a power five, that's for sure. The offensive line also sucked, which didn't help. And the defense was pretty putrid as well. So he really was on a bad team. And I thought he did, you know, with his legs, I thought he did a lot of good things that actually elevated them, especially in that Wake Forest game. I thought he really did some really good things. I think he, when he was on, again, when he was on last year, you saw the same flashes you did in 2020, the rocket arm, some really great throws that he made. He's a guy that really trusts his eyes and trusts his process. But then you look at games like Virginia Tech, and even early in the pit game, when he gets faced with pressure, he just collapses in on himself. I think he's mentally tough, but he really, really doesn't know how to handle pressure. And, and he also doesn't really know how to handle a pocket either. He'll make weird step-ups into pressure. And and there's also something that – and this is kind of a niche thing that I don't think you talk about a lot. But you have when you step up in the pocket and you move in the pocket, sometimes you're going to have to shift your base and shift your shoulders, right, to get, say, on target. So if if you need to step left, but your guy's going to be to the right here on, say, a a glance post route up here – you're going to have to shift a little bit to set your feet and get into position to throw that ball. Sam Howell like never resets his base and his feet. So when he ends up actually moving in the pocket, he ends up in a spot where he has to reset and it takes him three seconds. And by the time that happens, guess who's going to be there? The pass structures are going to be right in his face because he can't throw the ball. So his mechanics are kind of weird. And his footwork is a little bit antsy too. I think that's the biggest thing for how, and I'm not sure how you teach that, right? I'm not sure how you teach pocket management under pressure. I'm not sure how you teach Sam how to get out of the, the headlights when he's under pressure. I think that's going to be the big thing. And this year, I thought that was really his undoing. I think he had games where he elevated those around him. And I thought that was more so the games when the offensive line played fine. And I think you can directly correlate his play to the offensive line play. And so We'll see. I think that that was the biggest issue. I think it showed up more and more this year. And I think that's exactly why you were a little bit disappointed with what you saw from Sam. Yeah. Passer rating down uh, 25 points yards per attempt down uh, two and a half yards completion percentage down 6%. So certainly um, not the kind of see touchdown interception ratio down as well. So, you know, not the kind of thing that you were thinking when we thought at the beginning of the season that, how was going to be, I mean, he came into this season with people thinking he was a top 10 draft pick. Now, where does he end up? Because I'm not really sure, you know, similarly to, you know, I think really different evaluators are going to put him in different places in the hierarchy. It wouldn't totally shock me to see Sam Howell go at the end of the first round. It also wouldn't totally shock me to see him fall to the third. Is that about where you have him? I mean, I, I really think, of all these guys, he has the, the, the widest range for where he could end up. He could go anywhere from like 18 to New Orleans to, as you said, like the third round. So, yeah, he has a very wide range. I don't know what the NFL thinks of Sam Howe. I, I think that this one, you know, I, I think that this this is going to be a guy that's going to be very divisive among NFL circles. And you kind of heard that down in Mobile and both at the Combine where there's some guys that love Sam Howe. They love his arm. They love it. 
his mobility. They love what he can do out of structure. They love all that. They love his toughness. Then there are other guys that are like, this guy can't manage under pressure. He's got inaccuracy at times with his mechanics. His footwork's going to need overhauled. So there are some things. And then his size isn't prototypical either. He's, he's, he's going to be a true six foot uh, coming into the NFL, maybe six foot one. Um, so this is not going to be a guy that's going to be great size either, I guess. But, you know, when you look at what I think he's going to go, I think you're going to see him. He's the type of guy with his mobility, his arm, that can definitely slide into that back half of the first. A team like Indianapolis, uh, Detroit sitting there if they want to. You know, because Sam Howell's going to be a guy that even if he's drafted, not going to play him day one. But I, I, I could see us dealing with a Drew Locke situation here where – you know, a guy that maybe had been mocked in the first a lot falls to the middle of the second, and we get a team like Indianapolis, uh, Atlanta, if they don't draft the quarterback in round one. There are teams like that in the second round, I think, that make a lot of sense for Sam How Right in that middle, that 45-ish area, uh, the Steelers could trade up if they don't take one in the first round from 52 at that mark. Uh, so there are certainly, I think, interesting landing spots for him but again i agree he has a very wide range that he can go in i'm talking about the fit with the Steelers specifically if you're talking about a quarterback that might struggle under pressure uh, i'm not sure that's a good fit right now uh, despite some changes to their offensive line this offseason they certainly haven't proven to be able to protect the quarterback very well uh, but i do think a player like how is a fine fit stylistically for Matt, what matt canada is trying to do uh, he's comfortable moving he, he's a very um you know, he's a pretty fluid athlete. He actually think, like you said, Hal is actually better when you move him in the pocket, when the play is designed for him to move. I think he does better than sort of the out of structure movement where he's a little bit hit or miss, but you know, things like, you know, a sprint out or a shovel pass or a waggle or something like that, I think he'd be very comfortable with. And so, you know, I think he's in some ways a good fit for the Steelers, but that not being able to handle pressure part, I think we've seen some of that from Mason Rudolph, too, who's another one of the guys that, that's, I guess, in this mix. And I have a hard time seeing that being the Steelers quarterback in the near future. Now, obviously, the Steelers hope to fix that. I don't know. Can you draft based on how your team is now? Or do you have to, especially when you're talking about a guy who's probably not going to play this year, think more into the future and say, OK, we're going to have to fix this offensive line. And and with a good offensive line, maybe Sam Howe can be OK. And I think if you think that, Trading up a little bit to get him in the second round actually feels like a good move for the Steelers if they don't go quarterback with number 20. Well, you're definitely thinking in the future. You you have to. But the, the thing is, I don't think Sam Howell's going to be a quarterback necessarily that you're going to win because of. And we talk about this. There's a win because of and win in spite of. And not that he's going to be, you know, a guy that is going to be so terrible. Teams are going to want to move off him quickly. But I think when you look at what he's going to be, specifically with the Steelers, I don't think that the offensive line factors into anything, first of all. that It doesn't matter. You are going to face pressure regardless of how good your offensive line is. I don't care if your offensive line is the best offensive line to ever play in the NFL. You are going to have games where you face pressure. What if that game's the AFC Championship? Very likely, right? You're going to face better pass rushers. You're going to face better defensive linemen. And the, obviously, the playoffs are going to be when everyone steps up their game. So Hal's going to have to, to face his demons no matter how good that offensive line is. It could be less. And I think if you have a really good offensive line, yeah, you can get more out of Sam Howe. And so the Steelers are building that offensive line regardless. So maybe they can get more out of him, say, a year down the road. But I don't think that factors into it. If they think Hal can grow and overcome it and he's the guy, just get him. Just draft him. You don't factor in the offensive line. He's, again, he's not going to play this year. If you draft Sam Howe, it's going to be Mitch Trubisky and probably Mason Rudolph as his backup. Sam Howe's probably going to be the QB3. So, yeah, no, there's no reason not to draft him. If they think his arm and his mobility can, and then he can work on his mechanics and he can work on his pocket presence, they think they can fix that, go get him. But – uh, again, it's it's a tough one with the Steelers because specifically, I don't, you know, he, he comes from an RPO heavy scheme. So I think the fit makes sense. But again, I don't know what he is going to do if, say, he gets thrown into the fire this year. If he did, I think it would be an absolute abject disaster. That, that's not a good idea <laughs> at all. No, no, it's not. So. Again, don't think about this year. Think about 23, 24, 25. You think you have a better line then. 
how good is Sam Howe going to be? What's his ceiling? And that's kind of the projection they'd have to do. And if they think he can overcome what he has, then that's when you get him. If they can't, then honestly, keep it moving and wait for 2023. If you're at that point in the second round where you don't have a quarterback and you would assume that Ritter, Corral, Pickett, and Willis are all gone and maybe Howe's there. If you don't think he's the guy and you don't think he can overcome it, there's always 2023. And so, yeah, don't force That's it. That's why you, you don't get a Mitch Trubisky, it. so you don't need to feel like you make that move. You can say there's always 2023. I think if my choices are Pickett and Willis are off the board in the top 10, which is what I expect, if my choices are sit at 20 and take Ritter or Corral or hope Howell gets to 52 and take a Jordan Davis, uh, uh, you know, a Stingley, a Booth, an Olave, a Traylon Burks, I saw a mock to the Steelers this week. I think I'd go with that before I went with Ritter or Corral at 20. I think Hal in the second round has nearly the same upside and isn't really getting talked about in the first round as those other guys. I think, I think there's actually some value there if, if he falls to where the Steelers pick or near where the Steelers pick in the second round. Yeah, I, I, I do think that that is better value. And I think that they would have more – flexibility to do what they would want in the rest of the draft that too because I, I don't necessarily think that Sam Howe is devoid of upside he he has upside he has like some the, upside like, like there's no doubt about that he has upside the big issue is is that when you look at Sam Howe they are these are issues that are not fixable very easily right yeah. like things that are not very easily fixable pocket presence and pocket management like those are the two things you really want your quarterback to have can they feel pressure and can they move up in the pocket slide in the pocket no do they know how to to manage it that's kind of innate that's kind of a feel thing if you don't have it by now it's usually very tough i can't think of one great example of a quarterback that has corrected their pocket presence and suddenly become great. I can think of guys that have corrected their mental processing and have become better. Again, that's not easy to teach. Neither are the mechanics, but I can teach mechanics. I can teach mental processing to a degree. It's hard to teach pocket presence. It's hard to teach pocket management. So, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, but there's a reason he's probably going to go later than those guys. And it's because he has one, the one skill – relative to that guys like corral is going to be the mental evaluation meanwhile ritter is going to be mechanics but how has the pocket presence issue which is going to be really tough i think to correct we'll see if he can um but i i agree i would rather take how at 52 than reach on corral at 20 or ritter at 20 i think if how's there at 52 and i don't necessarily think he will be that's a good value pick yeah, I agree. And even if they get close in, in the 45 range, it doesn't cost that much to move up a few picks in the second round. I, I would be willing to do that too. If it gets, if it gets the Steelers, a Jordan Davis, if it gets the Steelers, a starting corner, if it gets the Steelers, a, a starting wide receiver, I think they still have, even though they've made some moves to shore up the cornerback position, I think that's a big deal and they still don't have a strong safety. So if Hamilton from Notre Dame is there, uh, talk about him falling, maybe uh, I think that's a good move too. So I think I would rather have one of those guys on my team and take a chance on Sam Howe, then take a chance on these other two guys. I think are you're still taking a chance. Maybe it's a smaller chance and there's a reason that they're rated higher, but I mean, I just think in a, you know, in a class where there are very few sure things, and really Kenny Pickett is is the only thing that I think is close to a sure thing. And even with Pickett, there are questions of exactly how good he can be, even though he has a very high floor. I think you're just taking a smaller risk when you when you use a second round pick instead of a first round pick, and you take someone who's I mean, the rod receivers at the end of the first round are awesome. I know the Steelers are not heavily scouting them, but I think there's really good value there. Davis, we talked about inside linebacker yesterday corner safety and these are places the Steelers need help so I I think the value is better to go that way but we shall see uh, a couple other pieces of news from yesterday Kevin Colbert went to Duke's pro day while he was in the Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill area not a lot of uh, draft notables on the Duke squad I like their center Wollabaw but he's he's more like a free agent type and uh, but that means that he's got two more. He said he was getting to 12 by the end of this week. Uh, we expect him at Alabama on Wednesday. 
Um, the other one is a less obvious, maybe West Virginia today. I'm headed there this afternoon. Maybe Western Kentucky to see Bailey Zappi. Thoughts about that? Yeah, I don't know. Um, it doesn't really jump out the page to you, right? There, there are a few. He could go to Washington as well if they want to go corners. There's like an invisible fence somewhere west of Texas that the Steelers just do not cross. <laughs> yes, I, I think that's true. But if they do magically go west, there's Trent McDuffie, Kyler Gordon. There are players there that I think would interest Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, but again, don't expect that. I think Kentucky on Friday is, is another one that they could go to. They have Kennard, they have Fortner, so they have two offensive line prospects. Um, they have Wandale Robinson, who's a receiver, kind of slot guy. Um, they have a few guys there. Pascal, the uh, pass rusher as well. So they have a few guys that I think would interest Pittsburgh. There, there are other places that they sometimes stop to. Florida State, maybe, with Jermaine Johnson this year. Um, that could be one. And as you said, Western Kentucky to see Paley Zappi is honestly one that is also interesting. Although I feel like if you had gone to see Zappi, you would have been at Caleb Ellaby's Pro Day too. And they weren't there. So we'll see if they're at Zappi's Pro Day. I don't know. They have the, the differences between that is that probably more than likely Ellaby's going to go a little later. Um, and, 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 here, and then also Zappi has D'Angelo Malone and edge rusher and Jared Stearns, a wide receiver who also they're going to probably look at and maybe be interested in. Malone's actually a, a very realistic mid-round option at edge, I think. Um, so we'll see. I don't know where he's going to go in terms of that last one. Obviously, he went to Duke as well. I don't think anyone expected that one. So who knows? Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe he's nowhere. going to Alabama and UAB on the same day or something yeah, like right. that. You know, uh, just throwing us all a curveball with that number. Uh, UAB is not uh, the same day as Alabama, but uh, Tennessee is. I don't know if, if that's feasible in, in one day or not. Um, maybe, possibly. I like uh, Cade Mays, I'm a very versatile offensive lineman. Um, who kind of fits a little bit what they were trying to get in Mason Cole, but um, certainly a younger version of that would be uh, desirable for the Steelers. A um, couple others coming up here, <clears throat> UCF, Houston, Oregon, Miami, Maryland, Purdue with uh, George Karloftis and David Bell. Somewhat interesting. NC State, Louisville, uh, Wyoming, Fayetteville State. And, oh, and UT Chattanooga. See, maybe you'll go see my guy uh strange who uh said he he was at the combine and told me that he loves being an offensive lineman because you get to be a jerk and hit people and the harder you hit them the more people love you for it i thought that was uh <laughs> the great the greatest description of that position ever yeah and far more explicit too than how you <laughs> yeah yeah it, I'll, I'll give you the pg version of that um <laughs> other big piece of news coming out on monday the steelers make a free agent signing or not official yet but reported to have made a free agent signing of a linebacker gennard avery an interesting guy uh drafted by the browns traded to the eagles after like his one season which you don't really see that often gets to the eagles as defensive end in a 4-3 scheme they move him to sam linebacker last year and he becomes a starter although not a particularly good one not a obvious fit for the Steelers I'm guessing they plan on using him as edge depth but his pass rushing numbers in the NFL are pedestrian even though that was sort of his calling card coming out of Memphis uh, any thoughts on Gennard Avery this signing how, how you how you see him fitting in well they should definitely play him in my opinion at edge uh, I think he has much better tools there in fact his rookie year honestly it's pretty good. He blew up I mean, the Steelers at, in his first game. He had a sack fumble. He had four other tackles. He, he was awesome. And then, you know, uh, I don't know what happened that Cleveland wanted to trade him in the middle of his second year. That is so rare. And it really seemed to derail his career from there. I don't think Philadelphia used this guy right at all. He didn't get a lot of pass rushing snaps. And that was the issue. He didn't get a lot of opportunities when he got – so here's the thing. When you look at pass rush snaps that he had, he had 200, he had uh, 230 total pass rush attempts in 2018. His first year with Cleveland had 40 pressures in those. And that is the highest number by far that he's ever had. He had four in Cleveland in 2019, 25 in 2019, 
63 in 2020, and he had zero true pass rushing opportunities as an edge rusher this past year. They moved him into almost a strictly off-ball Sam. He wouldn't line up on the edge. He would more so just, you know, be a gap-blitzing linebacker, essentially. Um, That's not where he is. He needs to be an edge rusher. And I think there's considerable upside here. I mean, you, as a rookie, a fifth-round rookie, he came in and got 40 pressures in his one year and about 230 four and a half sacks on those 40 pressures. Yeah, so pretty decent conversion rate too. Like not bad. Like that's not a bad number. That's about thirteen percent. That's about on thirteen percent of his pass rushes, he got a pressure. So not a bad number for Gennard Avery. I this is a guy that I think Philadelphia has kind of misused. And again, they gave him really limited opportunities. He he got about one hundred and fifty total pass rush opportunities as an edge rusher in Philadelphia from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty one. So I get it. They probably needed a Stam linebacker because if you know anything about Philadelphia, they are notorious for not investing in the linebacker position through the draft. So they probably needed it. And, and again, he can do it. That's not his best spot. His best spot is being a pass rusher. Let him go ball and see ball. Get, let and him be aggressive. You know, if you have a Sam linebacker in a 4-3, usually that translates to the Steelers inside linebacker position where they – just signed Miles Jack, so I don't know where you'd put him there either. I guess you could play heavy with him and Jack instead of Devin Bush. I don't know. It doesn't seem to make much sense if they're not going to use him outside. No, I think he's going to be an outside linebacker. I think he's going to be your third edge, and I think that's a quality third edge, honestly. I think in terms of – it kind of makes it so they don't have to go into camp with just Alex Highsmith and TJ Watt. And so now they have a guy that has – Yes, it was his rookie year. Has when he got got significant opportunities, he proved that he could do some good things. And so I think he can do good things. I think he'll get more opportunity here. I think he'll be a true pass rusher. I think he'll be a three, four outside linebacker. I think he could fit in in that three outside linebacker package that they run. And I think because he has that off ball versatility, they can use him in interesting ways in that package. Obviously, I don't know if they're going to bring that back with TA and Flores there but that 335 they play with essentially a third linebacker outside linebacker that they would play when they had Melvin Ingram Alex Ty Smith and TJ Watt last year and obviously Bud Dupree as well there's that off ball spinner role and then you also have kind of the guy that will work a little bit off ball hybrid I think Gennard Avery is going to actually fit in nicely as that off ball hybrid that they have in that package if they're playing on bringing that back against certain teams so I like the signing. I think it's got some upside too, and I think he'll be quality depth. They can still bring back Taco Charlton at relatively cheap, and then you can settle it out for the fourth spot between him and Tuska. So I think that's quality stuff. They needed edge depth. Now they don't have to necessarily draft one. Yep, I'm uh, I'm on board with all that, and I think um, you know when you look at what they did with Melvin Ingram, I think the thought was good there to bring in a guy who's more experienced, but I think this is more likely to work out, right? I mean, a guy that's been a bad fit where he is. Um, and I honestly feel like if you're talking about a guy who's bounced back and forth somewhat unsuccessfully between defensive end and Sam linebacker in a four, three scheme, who was obviously really talented coming out of college, then that probably means he is a three, four outside linebacker, right? That's where he belonged all the time. And so maybe the Steelers can provide him something uh, that, that will propel him going forward, just a one year deal, kind of a prove it thing. And so um, I, I think a solid move all around should be good for the Steelers and for the player, which is obviously important as we saw last year, because it doesn't work out for them. It doesn't work out for the team either uh anything else i'm headed to west virginia pro day today so we will have uh more on that tomorrow i'm very interested to see letty brown um who came out early and and so far has not had his draft stock uh reflect that decision positively but we shall see um and uh, a couple other guys i'm interested to see down there as well and also honestly just interested to see how uh, well attended that is from a scout standpoint i know the steelers are almost always there and will certainly be sending somebody but um you know maybe if that somebody is eddie faulkner that shows a little bit more interest in brown than anyone else uh anything else before we wrap things up duke pro day for uh kevin colbert yesterday as well i know he made that trip but not much but if i, I do find it interesting if he's there I and mean, you know doing his last year tour some day three running backs are starting to pile up here as well. You had Mateo Durant from Duke. You obviously had Ty Chandler, and then you had Letty Brown in that discussion. So maybe a late day three running back is in the cards here for Pittsburgh. 
certainly uh certainly could be the case um and uh like i said before you know if you guys have a question a comment something you want us to hit a prospect you want us to talk about a position a situation whatever anything uh leave us a comment hit us up on twitter we will get to it in a future episode of draft talk which will happen just about every day every weekday between now and the nfl draft at the end of april for Nick Farabaugh, I'm Alan Saunders. Thanks for watching Draft Talk on Pittsburgh Sports Live. Make sure if you're watching on YouTube, you like and subscribe to notifications uh, for the channel so you may you get the first episode of Draft Talk and all the other shows we have on Pittsburgh Sports Live first. Um, also, we're available now on Apple Podcasts and other podcast platforms. Uh, if you search Apple Podcasts or Draft Talk with Alan Saunders and Nick Farabaugh, we will pop right up. And that's another way you can enjoy this show. And of course, check out all of our work at SteelersNow.com as we prepare for the draft and the whole Pittsburgh Sports Now family and networks, albeit uh, West Virginia Sports Now, a little bit today uh, from their pro day as well. So check out all the content. We've got a ton of it. And it's been really busy the last few days with the NFL meetings and pro days and free agency still going on and all kinds of stuff. So there's a ton of content up there on the website. Make sure not to miss it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll be back with you next time for more draft talk for Nick. I'm Alan. We'll see you next time.